true honor to be here to represent the National Aeronautic Association and to recognize not only this magnificent aircraft, but more to the point, the crew who flew it on May 31st, 1967, and accomplished a mission so incredible, they were awarded the 1967 McKay Trophy, which is given each year for the most meritorious flight of that year. As was said already, this is the first time a tanker crew had been so recognized. Now, the McKay Trophy has been awarded since 1912. The first recipient was a young lieutenant named Hap Arnold. He received a second McKay in 1934 as a brigadier general, and also, by the way, a Collier Trophy for his work in World War II in 1942. So this award has a long and distinguished history. Names such as Arnold, Rickenbacker, Doolittle, and Jaeger adorn the trophy. Those who receive it are often honored, and they always tell me this, to, to be in such company. I'd venture to say that all of those great aviators I just mentioned are, feel honored to be in the company of those such as the crew of this airplane on May 31st, 1967. And I'm gonna use your ranks on that day. Uh, Major John Castile, Captain Dean Hoare, Captain Richard Trail, Master Sergeant Nathan Campbell, and Senior Master Sergeant Jack Barnes. And it's wonderful now your current retired ranks to have Lieutenant Colonel Castile, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Trail, and Senior Master Sergeant Barnes here with us today. I'm really honored to be in your presence. This is not one of those awards one sets out to win. Those, those airmen we just, we just talked about didn't get up that morning trying to win a McKay. In fact, we at NAA never really used that word, win, to describe the recipients of this trophy. Everyone whose names have been added to that trophy over the past 110 years simply set out to do their job, accomplish their mission, and on a particular day, that job and that mission took them to places few, few had ever gone and required skill and bravery most of us can't even imagine. Sometimes, like with the crew of this aircraft, the mission for which they were recognized wasn't even thought possible. Indeed, it was seen as outside regulations. We've already talked about that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm so amused. The, the part of this that's so great is that you were in trouble after it was over. I think that's awesome. But then Captain Trail said it best. Our philosophy was that we did what we had to do. Very simple, right? But hard, easy to say, hard to do. It was the first time three aircraft were connected at the same time for refueling. If they had not done what they did, and we've already heard about this, the crews of those planes would have had to eject over enemy territory. The KC-135 crew that day felt they had no choice. They would not abandon those depending upon them. The crew saved lives, they furthered the mission, they showed what was possible. For that, they, in this plane, will always be remembered. So on behalf of the National Aeronautic Association, let me say again what an honor it is to be here. It's our honor to recognize great achievement, and by bringing this aircraft, and especially the story of this crew, into this wonderful museum, their achievement will be recognized for generations to come, as it should be. Thank you very much. It was a busy day, but we were excited because we were going to go. We were starting back home. We left Utapau, met in the Gulf of Tonkin, refueled the F-104s that we were scheduled to fly. We did that a couple times. And then the Navy gave us a call. That's who directs traffic out there. And they asked us to head north for a possible emergency refueling. Well. We went on up there, and then John carried on most of the conversation, and we talked back and forth. They, they turned us over to the frequencies that the Navy tankers were on, and we talked to them, and we were, I don't know, 25,000 foot normal refueling altitude for us, and we told them, well, come on up, we'll give you fuel, and they said, they couldn't make it, it couldn't, wasn't possible. They had enough fuel to get that high. So John negotiated back and forth and settled on 5,000 feet, I think it was. And down we went. And then of course, I knew an A3D tanker was very similar to the Air Force B-66. See, we had no tech orders. We'd had no speeds or anything to fly for, for the Navy aircraft. But B-66 and the 
A3D, about the same airplane, different engines. And so we used the numbers for the B-66. We did the rendezvous, and John, had, he, he told the navigator, okay, we were right east of, Han of High Fong is where we were. And High Fong, east of that, where this guy had gotten shot down, is where the, the flak training school was for, for the North Vietnamese. And of course the range of a, oh, the guided missiles, was the SAMs at that time. And there's one back here, I got to look at the thing. It's, it's about 20 miles, so John says, hey Dean, we'll go right at it, but get us turned before, before we reach 20 miles, which we did, we made, we made the turn. And <clears throat> in come that A3D and hook up to us, and I pumped fuel to him. Actually, the B-66, you could run two pumps, and I turned on the second pump and blew him off, see? It was too much pressure for him, but he backed off and come in again with one pump, we were giving him the amount of fuel, and he, meanwhile, had the F-8 hook up behind him. And the boom operator collared at us and said, hey, he says he's refueling another airplane, same time we were. And he backed off and went over and sat on the, on the right wing where I could see him. And the second uh, A3D came in and hooked up. And as I remember, of course I couldn't see it, but Jack could, he was there. He, I think he hooked up tri-level too, but I'm not positive of that. So we satisfied them. We made the turn to head back south. We were supposed to recover in Okinawa, but uh, giving away all that extra fuel, we, had, we figured out Da Nang. But then we got another call, there were a couple F-4s, Navy F-4s coming out, and they didn't have enough fuel to make their tanker, so we turned around, met them, refueled them, and we used the same speeds we used for Air Force F-4s, and they come in and hooked up. And then we had to climb to altitude and satisfy our, our uh, 104s, our original receivers, and then we, we were committed. We couldn't make Okinawa. There's no way we had enough fuel. We chose Da Nang. That was basically the closest American base. And, oh, I used to manage the flight, order, flight manuals for this airplane, the series of airplanes. And we had about a 30-knot headwind going there. So for best range, I told John we need to go to 40,000 foot. And we were pushing... 30 knots faster than what the normal cruise is to satisfy that wind. And we had to land the Nang, and the Nang was busy, 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 but John muscled his way in and landed. And we shut down with 9,000 pounds of fuel on board, which was the absolute minimum we had to have. If we'd been less than that, we'd have been in trouble. But neat story about that too, we taxied in and they weren't happy to receive us at, at the Nang because they called us a rocket magnet, North Vietnamese rockets, <laughs> big airplane sitting out there. And before we unloaded, I saw this major come stomping out there, big barrel chested guy. He, he had an unhappy look on his face. He comes stomping out, we put the ladder down, and he comes up and he just cleared the floor of the airplane where he could see, and he looked up into the eyes of our navigator and says, Dean! They were old buddies from a former unit. We got a lot better service after that. So anyhow, we survived it. So it, it was it was quite quite a deal. We were busy. Then we we got a minimum fuel and went on down to uh, Okinawa, and we were greeted there with a one-star general that he had a lot of questions. But anyhow, John could talk about that how that all worked out. We were on our way home. We've been over there for three months, if I remember correctly, and uh, we one of the things people forget, we had two 104s was our mission to refuel, the, probably the best fighter airplane ever built by the Air Force. So it's a little bit like taking uh, two machine guns to a knife fight. You know, we were felt very safe in that regard. No MiGs were gonna bother us. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, I really thought it was an exceptional crew. I had an airline transport rating, which was kind of unusual. I was an instructor pilot, and uh, 
Dick was not only a uh, aircraft commander, I had trained him. In, uh, the first graduates of the Air Force Academy were also navigators. And uh, he was also a certified civilian flight instructor and had actually trained the navigator to fly an airplane. And, uh, so we, and our boom operator was, had an Arkansas driver's license. That's as good as you get. He, uh, he'd, he'd actually been a real operator before they had booms. And uh, so we, we thought we were better than most of crews. Uh, confidence curve probably exceeded our ability curve, but that's what it was, you know. We heard the whole story. Uh, Dick has a tape of it. We've got to get somebody to play. Uh, the Navy controller was actually crying on the radio. He said, you guys are all going to run out of fuel. We know it. You can't get to the carriers. And uh, uh, did you hear what had happened? Why the Navy got in so much trouble? He was, there was a pilot that was shot down in a, a dried out basin. And uh, they were using him for bait. At that time, they had shot up two armed helicopters. And the commander of the Navy fleet said, we're not sending him in anymore. And they said, go to hell, we're staying here until you get him out. And they stayed too long. And what they didn't know was the first tanker had 25,000 pounds of fuel he could offload but could not burn. So he would run out of gas before he could get it off. He was that low on fuel. And uh, to show you how critical it was, uh, when we made that turn away from High Fong, we were getting a little too close to the thing. Oh, they asked us to drop to uh, 5,000 feet. I said, why so low? And they said, they can't, they don't have enough fuel to climb that high. And uh, he came in there and he was, he said, uh, I said, I got to turn. He said, hold your course or I'll, I won't be able to get you. I don't have enough fuel. And we started that turn away from High Fong is when he hooked up the first time. The, and the interesting story <clears throat> about the uh, F-4s, I, as an instructor pilot, I always like to know how you motivate people to do things correctly. These two guys come up and they said, we have all of our low warning lights on uh, fuel tanks. He said, my wingman's in worse shape than I am. He said, he's coming in first. He hit the boom, which is a six foot hose. And the Navy's used to having a 14 foot reel that winds up and he, he knocked it off, backed it off. And the instructor, or the lead pilot said, back off, try it one more time. If you don't make it, punch out. That's how low they were on fuel. And uh, we were able to get those back. So we saved six airplanes. That was, you know, the, the privilege. Yeah. But it's kind of nice to train, train, train to do things and be bored to hell all the time and find something. And there wasn't a crossword or a, uh, any question about what we were doing. The crew was with me, and that was it, 100%. Did you ever uh, end up meeting any of those pilots you helped save? Uh, they were going to bring one to a uh, show they put, the Air Force Association put on for it, and he was flying for... Uh, FedEx and couldn't come. Uh, I did talk to one. I had one call me, and he said, uh, and what I told him, I said, if you guys really aren't in trouble, you know, let me know now so I can just go home and get another job. And they said, no, no, we'll, t we'll take care of it. This guy showed up, and he said, uh, you saved my butt, and he said, I owe you a bottle. What do you drink? And I said, well, I don't drink anymore. But I said, could you give me one more, one carrier landing? And he just hung up. They wasn't going to do that for me. <laughs> And I was a major, I think about four days, I just pinned on those major leagues. And my mother said, that's a good thing, your father's had you at a major for 10 years. So that was, that's how that Air Force stuff worked. Well, first of all, we ended up with more fuel than we should have had, because these 104s were given, our first part of our mission was to refuel them. So when we got them, they were completely loaded with fuel. And it, I think it was about 8,000 pounds of fuel. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it is to a 104. And, uh, like I said, we knew we had them with us that we were safe from the MiGs. What, what's it like to know that uh, your airplane that you flew on is here now in perpetuity for many decades to tell the story? It, it's really an awesome responsibility. You know, it kind of kicked my butt. I didn't stay in the Air Force, but I went all those years to night school and I wanted to use it. And uh, it was going to take me too long to get where I could get in a position to do that in the Air Force. So. Uh, uh, anything you have to tell uh, the youth? Why should people come see your story and see the stories that we share in the museum? Well, I think the history of the Air Force is here, and it's it's, it's live stuff, man. These are you know you can you can sit. You used to be able to sit in an F-16 simulator and fly it. If you, 
interested in the military, come here and see this and you'll join the Air Force. That's what I think. It's awesome.